The Dauntless. There's peace for a short time after he leaves the nerds to their thing. Thankfully, as he's leaving the area, there are several medical personnel arriving to ensure they don't just kill themselves in a silly accident. Those boys are useful and creative, but need to be checked in on fairly often to ensure that they remember to report things. It's almost the opposite problem with his usual R and D, while both provide insanely useful advancements. One of them tends towards incredibly dangerous and delivers to him reports that are uh, one or perhaps two rounds of misinterpretation away from being ransom notes and the other will fail to report a great deal and then show up with the secrets of reality when they can pull their heads out of their next project. He's at his desk and scanning the reports from the lawyers and assistants of the legal division. Miss Downshift is fitting in well down there, pun perhaps intended with the size-shifting transformer woman. There are numerous bits of spurious and, to be frank, irritating litigation being thrown at the undaunted, and if it were all in physical paper, it would be at least a foot high on a slow day. Thankfully, there are apparently certain patterns to most of the litigation, and most of it can be swept away with ease. In fact, a few have left open possible avenues of retaliation for them. Apparently, she wasn't quite ready to appear and argue things in court, but was a huge help in building cases and finding loopholes, especially when the claims being brought against them are slanderous and spurious by nature, leading to counterclaims. An unfortunate but prosperous source of revenue, albeit an unpredictable one. Speaking of revenue, his largest source is the pittance of a fee he had been able to set on human media. After the hack, there was no way to contain or control it, but there were still ways to profit. By setting the price incredibly low, most people paid without issue. Individually, it was just a few credits. In a galaxy where trillions of people were considered a fairly small population, it added up fast. Still, things seemed to be in order, and he moved on to... His desk lights up with an incoming call, and he presses the appropriate button on his intercom. Admiral Cistern here. Sir, Talonor of the Longleaf Clan wishes to speak with you. Send him in. Admiral Cistern answers, and a few moments later, the almost doll-like alien walks into the room. He had been fooled by those enormous eyes only for a moment. There is a strong mind behind them, a mind tempered by a galaxy as unfriendly to his kind as it was friendly to Admiral Cisterns. How may I help you, Seeker? I have finished my exploration of your people and my understanding of it. It is time I return to the Longleaf and make my findings known, Talonor says simply and without decorum. May I hear what you have to say of my kind, or is such a judgment not for outsiders to hear? You are an energetic and enduring people. Without Axiom as a tool for your growth, you hold no instinctual fear of us. Furthermore, by seeming cosmic joke, the features and stature of the tree eye invokes nurturing and protective instincts in yours. It seems too good to be true and my judgment is for other seekers to be sent to better see who and what humans are. It takes many eyes to see something in full. I understand. Hopefully, the troops won't be too distraught at your sudden departure. Perhaps if you said your farewells. Admiral Cistern offers, and in spite of the very definite species difference, he can see the disbelief and inner conflict within Talonor. I... Yes... It is strange that others would... He visibly pauses and stops himself before offering a salute. Thank you for your hospitality, Admiral Cistern. I am uncertain if we will meet again, but I can say for sure that the Longleaf will appear here at least once more. Admiral Cistern returns the salute. I look forward to hosting them. Safe journey, Seeker. The Triii gives a slight bow and leaves without another word. Admiral Cistern almost laughs. It took six months surrounded by aliens to make the kind of first contact he had actually been trained for. Foreign species holding humans at arm's length in order to figure them out before letting anything else happen. It was almost a relief. He had made some inquiries around the political scene. 
The Trii were regarded as either an innocent race that was so repellent that there was little if any way to offer restitution beyond giving them as much space as possible, or as a galactic scourge whose mere presence brought ruin and pain. Either way, the general consensus was that the Trii were to be avoided if one could manage it. Disseminating that bit of information among the crew had caused the little fellow to be even more appreciated and had improved his already stellar treatment. Nothing like a creature that appears to be a walking doll or plush toy to engender sympathy, especially when its story is so sad. Talanor had never mentioned how he had arrived on Centris or intended to leave, However, seeing as how he was a grown man of respectable intelligence, there was little doubt in Admiral Cistern's mind that there was some hidden ship the Trii would pilot away with ease. That bit of business done, he sits back down and skims the disciplinary write-ups and actions. Some can be dismissed out of hand, others not so much. There are a couple of whiners on board, those few idiots that used favors to get through the training were the main part of it. Generally, they had a small stack worth of complaints about the behavior of their fellow soldiers and no amount of demoting these idiots seemed to solve the issue. Religious zealotry combined with political viewpoints rarely ends well, especially when it so obviously clashes with reality. Unfortunately, Disciplining such people only fueled their victim complexes, and no amount of exposure to the flat facts of reality did so either. It was odd. He was dealing with insane zealots both without and within, and should there be a positive contact from Earth when all this was over, there would be an official complaint lodge about the training practices and letting such idiots through. Of course, after that, is his complaint about all the conflicting orders and the fact that literally every soldier was approached to be a subversive agent. Thankfully, the few that followed through were generally obvious with such thing and such people were often taken to the side and dealt with. Military positions of power are often compared to herding cats, but there is something distinctly wrong when it's more akin to herding scorpions. It doesn't take much longer for him to peruse through the last bits of incidental paperwork. An overview of the Dauntless and a few reports from the village on Serbo, the recruiting offices on Zalwar, and a few quick blurbs from the EFL. The last bit does take his attention for a bit. Vuxa 5 is apparently still getting a lot of attention in its area of space and now was sitting on roughly 14,000 kidnapping victims all male. They wanted permission to open up a training base on Vuxa 5 and see if they can't get the more aggressive men up to snuff. He quickly signs his approval and puts it in the outgoing. He then drafts a few orders of business of his own to ensure that they have the full blueprint and training manuals to get things started. They're going to need drill instructors, cooks, logistical officers, a mess hall, a barracks, training field, weapons, uniforms fit to numerous different widely differing species and many, many other such things. Getting a training base up and running is no simple affair and their forces and ability to project power is already stretched thin. So many opportunities and not enough men to jump on them all. The best solution is to recruit like mad so they can have the manpower needed to take advantage of it all. Of course, even then, Taking advantage of every opportunity and repelling every setback is going to be impossible. There's simply an infinite number of both and no army is endless. Paperwork done. He cracks his neck and quickly gathers a bundle before getting back on the move. Despite his delegation having left things fairly simple and straightforward, there are some things that you can't delegate. Exercise and self-care among them. Five minutes later, he's jogging on a treadmill and letting his mind wander and clear as he physically moves and improves himself. Of course, he notes as Private Stream walks in with both a tall bottle of water that's cool enough to sweat and a data pad. You're going to have to read out loud if you want me to hear that report private. Sir! Yes, sir! The over-eager's private replies, walking up and putting the water in the holster on the treadmill. 
he then picks up the data slate himself and clears his throat. The purchase and refurbishment of all space stations has begun in earnest and they have started their trek towards the edge of cruel space. They're not the fastest, so there's going to be a delay of about a year until they get there. Private Stream reports and Admiral Sister nods even as the treadmill accelerates. To the point private, exercise is a fairly private affair, Admiral Sistern says, and Private Stream hands over the data pad. It is not about the space stations. Everything is going to plan with the stations, although a few suffered some bad accidents long ago and we needed to shift some very old dead bodies. Laser scoring was needed to really get rid of the things. I see. He answers as he reads out a report of numerous infiltrations of nearby groups that Harriet has accomplished. In her place as a clerk, she's been able to sort through a great number of details. Will we be able to get our null space functional stations working, or are they still prototyping? Still prototyping. Private Stream says before walking around and pointing to one part of the report. It reads about a few groups that are looking into human laws and psychology, specifically to try and better lure in boyfriends. It's fairly innocent, but there are numerous listed bad actors from less friendly groups. It's going to be a long upwards process, and we're angling towards using spin gravity so that people have a place they can actually stand up in. I think the term was O'Neill Cylinder? Very interesting. It would allow our soldiers a place to relax and recover if they find themselves under some kind of axiom-based affliction. He notes out loud as he rapidly takes in several of the ill-intended groups. Interestingly enough, there's one based around breeding the most potent and capable warriors in the galaxy, and they want to see what would happen if they bring human lineage into the mixture. Considering that their primary means of doing so are sperm donations, romance and adoption the Arlie Toss clan is outright agreeable despite their eugenics-driven ideology. He reads further as Private Stream starts babbling about easily ignored details and other things he's already well aware about. It's just an audio haze. The gym is one of the areas of the ship that people just assume to be bugged at this point. Some of the propositions being tossed at him by Private Stream are his own ideas and things he's outright ordered to happen, meaning they can be safely ignored. The Arli Toss clan is primarily composed of the Takra people, with the exceptions being non-Takra sons and daughters. Or the Takra Takra, as they call themselves, as apparently Takra just means people in their primary language and repeating a word emphasizes its importance. To that end, the note states they call humans the human man, an interesting way to go about things, but not one he can deny. It's a BMO species number 16 with the typical one over 100. Vaguely feline appearance, but looking closer to an alpha than a phalli. Until they utilize axiom and literally shapeshift like Yorgua, albeit with only one non-standard form, but a very capable one. Apparently, a Takra, or rather Takra Takra, as they find more polite, can slowly modify their other form and shapeshift into it at will. But they go nearly berserk and animalistic in that state. Very protective as a general rule, they also hate being underestimated, which means they've been butting heads with the larger races of the galaxy for a very long time. Apparently, it takes beating them directly in battle in both their form of reason and form of war to actually get them to calm the hell down. Which explains why they've not been around so much as Zadin, Canador, Lydris, and Apuk are people they've been known to outright war with due to their prickly pride. Some colonies of calmer Takra Takra are floating around showing that much of the bitter attitude is cultural rather than genetic. The other form is concerning, though. His initial reaction to the Jorgwa was wondering how the hell he's going to explain a species of were-crocodiles and if he was going to have to explain literal werewolves in the future. Considering he's looking at what appear to be were-saber-toothed tigers, the answer seems to be yes. They apparently like the idea of human endurance and want to see if they can genetically add that in. 
Survey says from the first few babies being born that the answer is yes, so they're starting to make a move. He's not sure if he should deny them the chance or let them do it. The end goal is somewhat scummy, but the method is fine. Sperm donations, adoption, and outright romance are far from a problem. Is it the ends that justify the means and therefore something that should be stopped, or the means that justify the ends and something he should let happen? He needs to give this some more thought. Everything seems to be in order private stream. Thank you for the water, but please, I need at least some time in the day where I can empty my mind and just do something physical. Sorry, sir. I was told you needed this information yesterday. Not your fault, soldier. Carry on with your duties. Yes, sir. The exaggerated salute has enough enthusiasm in it for an entire squad, and Admiral Cistern has to resist snorting in amusement. The man's missed his calling, he should have gone into acting. 